You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Good day, Bruce. Good day, Bruce. This is Bruce Outfield. That's right, and this is Bruce Anklevich. And this is the Dean Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. This is Volume 1, Number 2, Page 31. Good on you, Bruce. That's right. Hey, didn't we have a third host? Oh, that's right. Our uh, third host is uh, RO80T over there. His name's not Bruce. Uh, no, it's uh, RO80T. Uh. Mind if we call him Bruce just to keep it straight? All right. Good day, Bruce. Good day, Bruce. All right. Today's story is The Seas of Castle Hill Road by Rick Kennett. Australia, Australia, Australia. Australia, Australia we, we love, love you. you. Amen. Amen. Rick Kennett is a lifelong resident of Melbourne where he works in the trans. Oh, dude, I give up. Rick Kennett is a lifelong resident of Melbourne where he works in the transport industry as the longest-serving motorcycle courier in Australia, if not the galaxy. When not indulging in his hobby of wandering cemeteries, necrotourism, he's writing stories, uh, ghost stories mainly. His work has appeared in Aurealis, Andromeda Spaceways, Weird Tales, and several anthologies including Terror Australis, Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, and More Great Ghost Stories. He's also the co-author with A.F. Chico Kid of 472 Shane Walk, Karnacki, The Untold Stories, from Ash Tree Press, 2002. The Seas of Castle Hill Road was previously published in Eidolon, number 9, in 1992. The anthology Strange Fruit from Penguin Australia, 1995, and Enigmatic Tales, number 9, in July 2000. It's part of a series of stories featuring Ernie Pine, the reluctant ghost hunter. Hopefully we can talk Rick into sending us a few more of those stories in the future. The story is read for us today by two gracious volunteers. We didn't want to submit our listener to the torture of listening to our Australian accents for a whole story. So the story is read by Cameron Horsborough, who you can find on the net at spiritcry.wordpress.com, and Jacinta Lodge, who you can find at jacintalodge.com. <laughs> The Seas of Castle Hill Road by Rick Kennett The sound of the sea came through the open window. I sat up in bed, listening, knowing it was good 40 kilometres to the coast. I was up from Melbourne, staying a couple of weeks in Queensland with my friend Sonja van Hoven, recuperating from pneumonia. Sonja had suggested the visit in one of her letters by saying a warmer climate would do me good. Sonia's was a hot weather house, a whitewashed timber place built on stilts, with a wide front veranda, sash windows and high ceilinged rooms, big and open to catch the breeze. Three or four times a day the coal trains rumbled loud through the valley, trailing their long echoes through the rooms. And on some nights, so it seemed, a not there sea could be heard surging in the tropical dark. I leaned out the window and listened to the slap of waves far away, knowing there were only hills and valleys pushing to the horizon. Castle Hill Road lay dark under its two widely spaced streetlights, and nothing moved. On impulse, I sniffed for the salt air and smelt nothing, and within a couple of minutes, the sea sounds had faded into silence. I decided not to say anything about it to Sonia. I'd had quite enough experience with the occult, thank you very much, and if her house had anything cock-eyed about it, I just didn't want to know. Besides, it's bad manners to find fault with a hostess's home, be it plumbing, bedbugs, or a non-existent ocean washing around outside your window. Sonia came yawning into the kitchen early next morning. Good morning, Annie. Sleep all right? It was a question I suspected of being loaded. Originally, a child immigrant from Holland, she'd grown dark under the thirty-odd years of the Queensland sun, but right now she looked a little pale. Slept like the proverbial, I said, making a point of looking busy with the kettle. And you? 
Woke up around two this morning with this funny hissing noise outside the house. Sort of like the sea. Must have been the wind. She paused at the kitchen window and looked out at the still trees and unhurried clouds. You know, I think I've heard it before on one or two other nights. My scalp began to creep. Toast or cereal? I asked, desperately. Yes, I have heard it before. The sea. Weird, huh? Yes, weird, which is what I was afraid of. Half an hour later, as Sonia climbed onto her bike to rumble off to work, she said, You know, I feel guilty leaving you here like this, particularly with your illness. That's just your Dutch hospitality coming out, I said. Anyway, you wouldn't accept any rent, so the guilt's all mine. Now, go away so I can indulge myself with your books and records and videos, not to mention your fridge. Which was about the limit of my activities. Thanks to the lingering effects of my pneumonia, I was prone to tiredness and shortness of breath. At any rate, there was nowhere to go in this semi-rural area. Streets ran off over hills and under rail bridges, going nowhere, as far as I was concerned. After washing up the breakfast things, I wandered outside with Axel, Sonia's good-natured, slobbering Doberman. I took a close look at the area beneath my window where the ground was dry and the grass was patchy. If I was looking for shells or seaweed, I was disappointed. In fact, I was relieved. The sea had probably been washing around Sonia's house on intermittent nights long before she'd even bought the place six years ago. It seemed a harmless enough phenomenon, so I thought I'd best not start snooping and maybe unravelling threads which might lead to God knew what. Wet God knew what, if the sea had anything to do with it. This is what I told myself as I started snooping between the stilts under the house. <laughs> Later that morning, I sat myself down in an old cane chair on the front veranda with a book I'd picked at random from the shelves. I was still dusty from scratching around under the house, having found only empty boxes, corroded pipes and rotted planks, evidence of past renovations. Nothing nautical, no ship's compasses or giant clams or stuffed starfish. Not even a punctured beach ball. Axel had followed me in, getting dust in his coat as he sniffed at things he'd probably sniffed at a thousand times before but finding nothing to get excited about. There were no sailormen's ghosts under there. I made myself comfortable in the cane chair on the sunny veranda and opened the book. It proved to be a gardening manual in Dutch. God for dummer, I said, using my only Dutch expletive, quickly changing to Anglo-Saxon as Axel began barking in the backyard. I hurried through the house to the back stairs and leaned out over the banister. There was nothing unusual to be seen. The backyard, the bushes, the grass... Axel! He came bounding up the stairs, all legs and sighs, his claws clattering, skidding across the landing as he tore past me into the house. From the top of the stairs I took another long look around the yard, saw nothing, then followed Axel inside. He lay under the living room table, a big black dog shivering, half mad, very scared, his dusty coat smelling wet, smelling of the sea. Axel, good boy, I said, with an edge to my voice. He came out slowly crawling on his belly. I patted him. He was dry. Yet a second later, he stood and shook himself, and cold wetness stung my face and hands. I wiped at them, although there was nothing really there, then wrapped an arm around the dog, feeling him tremble, his animal fear of the unknown, and through him felt my own. From the open back door came the sound of the sea rising around the house, a brief swell of waves, and silence. All at once I felt horribly cold and shaky. There'd been no malevolence in the moment, only unreasoning fear, the sort that comes with the inexplicable and the supernatural. Axel, on the other hand, had forgotten his fear and was now placidly scratching himself while looking up at me, as if to say, So what else is new? He no longer smelt wet, merely doggy. Not really knowing what I was doing, I closed and locked the back door, closed and locked the front door, shut tight every window. It was while I was doing this that I noticed the holes in the window frames. They were evidently very old holes, and a lot of them were almost completely filled with many years of paint, making them little more than dense in the woodwork. In this tropical climate of hot days and humid nights, someone, at some time in the house's past, had nailed shut all its windows. <laughs> I was glad we didn't have fish for tea that night. Sonia made something she called rice thing. Part fried rice, part leftovers, part anything to hand, stirred around in the electric pan. It was the nicest rice thing I'd ever had. 
Later, over the washing up, I said, So how old is this place? 1920s? Don't reckon. 20s style was more ornate, all round verandas, carved features and such. These houses are called Queenslanders. That's original. She flicks soap subs at me. And most of them are the same basic design, built between the turn of the century and the 30s. This is one of the later ones, not too exotic, not too fashionable, only a front veranda, but hell, it keeps the rain off. Didn't think you lot knew what rain was up here. Monsoons? We get the tail end of them when they sweep through up north. I suppose that's the only time you close your windows. That and a few weeks during winter. We do have winters up here, Ernie, even though we don't have glaciers grinding through the main streets like you do down your way. Not to mention our marauding hordes of killer penguins. But tell me, who nailed all your windows shut? Sonia stopped suddenly with her hands deep in the suds and gave me a funny look. How did you know about that? Saw the nail holes in the woodwork. She looked through the kitchen door into the living room. I thought so. You've closed all the windows. Yes. She looked again. You locked the back door? Yes. Why? Perhaps for the same reason the windows were nailed down in the first place. She stared at me and gave a puzzled laugh. Ernie, this house was owned by a little old lady who checked under her bed each night and nailed the window shut to keep the boogeyman out. Is that why you closed and locked everything? Maybe. Did you ever meet the previous owner? Hardly. It was an estate sale. She'd been dead a year when I bought the place. And who told you why the windows had been nailed shut? She shrugged. No one, I suppose. But it's obvious, isn't it, given the circumstances? She took a corner of the tea towel I was wiping dishes with and dried her hands. What are you getting at? Why the interest in the windows? Because I think your house is haunted. Come into the living room. I racked my last dish and followed her through. We sat down and Sonia said... Ghosts? That was a hard question to answer. It was such a vague term. So I told her about the sea sounds. That? She said. That's just the wind in the trees making freak noises now and then. I've heard it a couple of times myself. I told her how terrified Axel had been, how he'd acted as if soaking wet even though he was dusty dry. Sonia called to him and the big Doberman lumbered over. Are you sure, Ernie? She stroked Axel's back. He seems all right. He wasn't this morning, and neither was I. I hesitated. Sonia, we've been friends for a number of years now, and we have many things in common. Bikes, and travel, and music, and films, and how I tried to learn Dutch once, along with the other interests we share. And although the supernatural isn't one of them... You're sounding like you're proposing to me, Ernie. Eh? Yes, I was sounding that way, which didn't make things any easier. No, no, it's just that... I hesitated again, then quickly said, Sonia, I think I'd better leave. Leave? Why? What do you mean, why? Haven't I just been telling you? Whether you believe it or not, your house is haunted and I don't want to know about haunted houses anymore. I've had too many bad experiences with things like that. But the worst bit is I know myself too well. If I stay here, I'll start snooping. And if I don't find anything, I'll go crazy. And if I do find something, I'll start digging and probing at it till it turns nasty. It's what's happened before. Why should it be any different this time? Okay, okay. She said. I'll grant you your ghostly sea, but how can that hurt you? Axel apparently came in contact with it and he seems all right. She scratched him under the chin and his tail stump wagged. That's just it. In the last six years, you've heard the sea two, three times, right? Now suddenly it's hurt twice in a day and gives Axel an imaginary soaking. Are you saying your arrival here is causing this somehow? Not causing it so much as waking up to something that's been here dormant for at least the time of your occupancy. I've done something or there's something about me that's stirred up old echoes in this house, all of which gives me another damn good reason to leave. Right? Sonia was silent for a moment and said, No, no, you're not right. If anything, it's a damn good reason for you to stay. You say you know yourself too well. I think you don't know yourself enough. When you've written to me in the past about your ghosts, I have to admit I took it all with a grain of salt. But more than this, I read between the lines and saw the person you are. You're part bluster, part coward and part hero. The more you want to run away from these things, the more you want to find reasons to face them. Even though you know the risks, the occult draws you again and again of your own free will, Ernie. Your own free will. You may deny it to yourself, but you thrive on this sort of thing. A long time ago you told me someone once described you as an uncouth Don Quixote. Well, they were half right. Anything else you want to tell me about myself? I asked, feeling every minute more and more exposed. Only this. 
After all I've just said, you may still feel perfectly justified in leaving, but I don't think you will, despite what you've said about your attitude towards these things. And you know why? Why? I said in a small voice, readying myself another glimpse into the mirror. Because you don't have the money for alternative accommodation and your return plane ticket's not valid for another 12 days. She smiled and gave me a wink. Like it or not, Ernie, you're stuck with me and my haunted house until then. The ocean sounded again through my window that night. I tried to sleep, but waiting for the sound to return had kept me awake. It had probably been there a few minutes before I realised it. Soft it was, a gentle sea, possibly almost a flat calm. Once again I looked out the window, but there was nothing to see or smell. I pulled on my trousers and made for the back door. My bed was in an area adjacent to the living room, separated from it only by a couple of carved wooden posts. I had to pick my way carefully past tables, shelves and cabinets in the dark. A door creaked open behind me. Turning, I saw a vague white figure emerge from the darkness. The figure said, Do you hear it? Christ, Sonia, don't do that. You scared me half to death floating out here in a white dressing gown. Listen. We stood together by the back door as the sound of the ocean washed up at us from the yard. So it's true, she said. Yes, I gallantly refrained from adding, I told you so. I opened the door and stepped outside onto the landing. The ocean sounded no louder here, but seemed to come from all directions as if the house were an island. There were no lights on in the places either side and at the back, which made me wonder if it were too soft and calm to be heard by our sleeping neighbours, or if the sound simply didn't exist beyond the fences. We crept down the stairs where we found Axel cringing in his basket under the house. He bared his teeth and growled as Sonia tried to pat him. He was frightened out of his wits. He'll come down when the phenomenon stops, I said, and we moved on to the front of the house. The ocean moved with us, never louder, nor softer, nor from any one direction. At the front gate I tested my theory, stepping out into the street, out into dead silence. What does this mean? Sonia whispered. God knows, I whispered back. We re-entered the front yard, re-entered the sound of the ocean to find the air had gone bitterly cold. Sonia exclaimed with a shiver and wrapped her dressing gown tighter about herself. Wearing only jeans and a t-shirt, I had to rub my arms briskly to ward off goose pimples. My bare feet hurt with cold, making my dash back out into the street more of a fast hobble. Sonia in slippers didn't fare much better. It was warm in the street, warm and silent. Axel, said Sonia. Bracing ourselves, we returned into the sub-zero temperature of the yard, picked up a half-frozen dog from his basket and lugged it outside. Did you notice our breath, I said? How it didn't fog, she said, tending to Waxall, who was quickly recovering from both cold and fear. I wondered why. Maybe the cold's not real. Is this a new phase of the haunting? I shrugged and rubbed my arms again. The cold had gone, but the memory lingered. After a minute, Sonia said, well, we can't stay out here all night. You don't want to go back in, do you? It's my home, Ernie. I'm not letting some ghost freeze me out. Well, you go ahead. Freeze your... bum off. Well, I almost said tits, but I didn't know her that well. She didn't move, and I didn't blame her. The Queensland night was humid and warm. It doesn't make sense, she said suddenly. Dutch doesn't make sense, I said, remembering my attempts to learn the language. You don't have enough experience with it, she answered off-handedly. Exactly! We haven't had enough experience of these sorts of things to know why they do what they do. There's sense here, if only we understood it. I grinned. Made you answer your own argument, didn't I? Je bent ook ton slimmerig. What's that mean? Never you mind. She ducked her head quickly through the gate. The sea's still there, and it's still freezing. Is there a thermometer in the house? On a nail by the back door. But why do you want a thermometer? Aren't you goose pimples evidence enough? Just want to find out how cold it is. Or at least see how real this cold is. Bracing myself, I belted into the yard, hitting the cold like a brick wall. 
My feet were two lumps of numbness by the time I got to the back door where the thermometer read a comfortable 22 degrees Celsius. Yet even as I looked at it, my teeth chattering, my nose beginning to leak, I felt the air grow warm again. And with this, the ocean faded into silence. But a second before it did, I thought a new sound crossed it, a low mutter like the distant hubbub of human voices. The house had no fireplace, nor any sort of fixed space heater. But Sonia was able to dig out a one-bar electric job from somewhere. Just to be on the safe side. I brought a jumper up with me on my tropical holiday, probably out of habit, and before returning to bed that night I laid it out where it could be grabbed in a hurry. Sonia, I want to go into town with you tomorrow. Why? Research. I want to find out the what, where and why of who owned this house before you. Right back to when it was built and what was on the land before that. Are you expecting more phenomena? Yes. I think this thing has only just begun. Your pneumonia and riding bikes, even on warm days, won't mix well. Why not take the train? Because the station's too far for me to walk in my condition. I'd be out of breath before I got halfway. Anyway, I'll go stir crazy if I don't get back on the road soon. Besides, it'll give me a flimsy excuse to hold you around the hips. She muttered something about... Typical male. Adding that I could hold on to the grab rail like everyone else. Which is what I did. Another awful truth revealed itself the next morning when we biked into Brisbane. After 16 years of motorcycling, I still didn't know how to ride properly on the back, leaning when I shouldn't, not leaning when I should. Sonia spent the whole ride screaming at me over her shoulder while trying not to wobble through corners. Ernie? She said, propping her machine in the Ann Street motorcycle park. You're a dear friend, but you're a shit pillion. Heading off to her office, she left me, properly admonished, to make my way to my first stop, the registry of births, deaths and marriages. People think ghost hunting is all bell, book and candle. Well, only up to a point. The use of magic, technology and common sense all come into it, along with holding lonely vigils in dark places with your nerves strung out to breaking point. Most of the time, however, is poking around in archives and libraries, arming yourself with knowledge. The deed to Sonia's house had named a Mrs Emma Milstead as the previous owner. She had in fact built the house in 1931 on vacant land subdivided from an old dairy farm whose title went back under a single family's name to early settlement days. An hour searching in the archives discovered little about any of the previous owners, and all I found of Emma Mills said was a death certificate which gave her date of death, which Sonia probably would have been able to tell me for free. Under cause of death, I hoped to find a lead. Drowned, lost at sea, eaten by a shark, something, anything, but it was nothing more than heart failure. Mrs. Milstead had, after all, been in her nineties. Next stop was the map section of the Brisbane Library, but the Castle Hill Road district showed no water courses other than a creek some kilometres to the east. Maps printed around the turn of the century showed the area as dairy grazing land. At the end of the day, I met Sonia back at the bike park and, with me sitting rigid this time on the pillion seat, we weaved our way through the five o'clock traffic. Over dinner I related my adventures in the Information Society. Then after the maps I checked out the electoral rolls, naturalisation records and probate. And? And nothing. There's just too much information. I don't even know what I'm looking for exactly. Some reference to the sea? Well, I checked the shipping lists and, surprise, surprise, found all the previous owners' names. The thing is, Ernie, whatever is causing this haunting may be the simplest thing, and not everything we do and say is set down in ink. I wouldn't have thought so, I said, remembering mountains of ledgers and lists. That night, the roaring began. We were watching Sonia's favourite movie, Brief Encounter, a 40s melodrama of railway platforms and illicit love. Once or twice we had to pause the tape, freezing the black and white trains of a long ago London while a real train hauled its noise slowly past. And every now and then we paused just to listen to the night. What we'd been waiting and listening for started gently enough. 
It was as if something gigantic had rubbed against the house. The floor, the walls, the windows rattled very faintly for 10 or 15 seconds. Sonia turned off the video. The sea sounds and cold were returning, seeping back into the house, getting louder, getting colder every minute. With them came the voices again, a murmur, a confusion of several animated speakers, yet with still no words distinguishable. Axel whined and belly crawled under a table. We put on our warm clothing and plugged in the heater. This time, we were going to wait it out, if possible, get close to it. We waited, huddled on the couch as the temperature dropped and the murmur of people in the sea drew nearer. All at once, the night exploded into one mighty roar of solid sound far above us. Axel jumped up, knocking the table flying and plunged down the back stairs. With our hands clapped to our ears, we scrambled down after him, where we found him cringing again in his basket. Unable to lift him, we simply dragged basket and all out of the front gate. I don't believe it, said Sonia, in the sudden silence and warmth of Castle Hill Road. Did you notice how nothing vibrated, I said? A noise like that should have shook the walls. It shook me, I can tell you. But I bet your ears aren't ringing, right? She listened a moment. No, no they're not. And after that they should be ringing like a ten-gong alarm. Exactly. That proves the sound's not real, just like the cold's not real. Sonia knelt down, patted Axel and whispered reassuringly to him. It must be a replay of something, I thought aloud. Sonia looked up from the dog. Of something that happened here, in my house? Don't think so. It never gets that cold here, so you keep telling me. No, something's been brought into your house, probably a long time ago and from far away. It's laid dormant until now, because for some reason I've set it off. Anyway, what could have been in the house that'd make that sort of noise? Sounds like steam. You mean from a train? The line never came up here, did it? I mean from a ship. The ship that brought my family out from Holland let off steam once and it sounded just like that. One hell of a noise. It's something you don't forget, particularly not when you're a five-year-old. Yes, and it fits in with the sea. A ship blowing off steam. I ducked my head through the gate. The cold was still there. The roar was still there, loud enough to wait. I refused to finish the thought. Sonia, why did your ship blow off steam? My dad said there'd been a problem with one of the boilers. She smiled at the memory. You know, I thought we were... She stopped suddenly, her smile disappearing. She whispered. I thought we were sinking. We both looked through the gate again with what would have had to have been the weirdest thought. Was a ship sinking there in the yard? One o'clock. I lay on my bed waiting, listening, trying to go to sleep, going nowhere. The night was silent and humid again, but I couldn't be guaranteed to stay that way. There was nothing to say the phenomenon was limited to one performance per night, and there was nothing to say it wouldn't happen again once morning came. It had happened once already during the day. It could happen again at any time. Just before two I fell asleep and drifted into a confused dream of slowly approaching doom and discordant music. Wood grated on wood, slamming. I jumped awake, fright stinging through my nerves. The noise echoed into silence. The room was still, no cold, no ocean sounds. But down the far end of the room a vague figure was creeping towards me along the wall. It stopped at the middle window of the room, reached up, and slammed it shut. And as it turned and moved toward the last window by my head, I saw it was Sonia. I called to her, but she paid no attention. She was sleepwalking. I'd often heard it's dangerous to wake a sleepwalker, though it's never said why, and as I'd only heard this in movies, I'd always considered it just so much Hollywood crud. But as she approached, I felt less sure of myself. If this was a new development, it meant the phenomenon had changed from external mental projections to something intensely internal, though what that in turn meant was beyond me. Nevertheless, here was a chance to get some answers. Sonia stood now by the last window, staring out with eyes I was sure saw nothing of the real world. Her face was relaxed and expressionless, her hands lay lightly on the sill. Who are you? I asked quietly. She made no reply. Are you Emma? Still nothing. If this was a replay of past events, talking to her would be as productive as talking to a movie screen. I tried a different tack. 
Sonia, Sonia, this is Ernie. What do you see? Make that wretched crying stop, she said suddenly in a voice not her own. Make it stop. A tear formed in her right eye and trickled down her cheek. It was more than I could stand to see. I took her shoulders and shook her once, twice. She blinked, suddenly awake and stared around. Ernie? What's going on? Why? She brought her hand to her face and discovered the tear. She looked from her wet fingertip to me, puzzled. I sat her down on the edge of my bed and told her what she'd done and what she'd said. But all she could remember was a confused dream of slowly approaching doom and discordant music. Collateral damage. Exactly. Borrowing a car from Mrs. Roberts next door, Sonia took Axel over to her mother's place some nine or ten kilometres away. It was Saturday, which was just as well as neither of us looked particularly bright after last night's developments. Axel, on the other hand, was sticking his head out the car window and happily slobbering, a far cry from the cringing, whining mess he became at each manifestation, a victim of something he could never understand. Collateral damage, I said, recalling a bit of military doublespeak for civilian casualties. Exactly, said Sonia, and drove him off to safety. Now it was just the combatants, or at least for the moment, a combatant, very singular. After doing the breakfast dishes, I sat down and tried to read, but my attention kept straying. I couldn't find interest in a video or record. There was a sense of waiting in the house, which was getting oppressive. Activity, I said to myself, and looked for where Sonia hid the hoover. Not finding it, I had to settle for a carpet sweeper. Now, whether the activity and the thought were related or not, I don't know. But while I was push-pulling along the front hall, it occurred to me, whatever happened to Mr. Milstead? He wasn't mentioned on the deed to the house. Emma Milstead had been the sole owner, so presumably she was widowed or divorced by 1931. She'd been British, so I guessed her marriage certificate and anything pertaining to Mr. Milstead would be in the British Public Record Office, which could be accessed through the Australian Joint Copying Project. But that was in Brisbane, and still a weekend away. There was nothing to be done until then. Or so I thought. A casual glance out the window made me think otherwise. I took a stroll outside, heading next door, making sure the woman working in the garden there saw me coming. This was Mrs. Roberts, the neighbour Sonia had borrowed the car from. Hello, said Mrs. Roberts, shading her eyes from the morning sun. She was white-haired. She was wrinkled and dark and looked about fifty, though she may have been much older. You're the chap staying with Sonia, aren't you? Up from the south or somewhere? To these charges I pleaded guilty but insane. So Sonia's left you to mind the house, she said. Just to take Axel over to her mother's place, so I thought I'd go for a bit of a walk. I had to remind myself that I was not telling a lie, strictly speaking. I was going for a walk. My motivations for it were completely beside the point. We got talking then, and as unobtrusively as possible, I moved the conversation around to the previous owner of Sonia's house. Mrs Milstead? Oh yes, I remember her, said Mrs Roberts. A very private lady, though. Kept to herself a lot. She was a widow, wasn't she? I had the impression from what she let be known that her husband had died very early on and she'd never remarried. And she died in the house? Yes, it was such a shock to the people in the street that knew her, because even though she was probably well over 90, she was a strong woman for all that. The sort of person you think's going to go on forever? I often saw her from a kitchen window pottering about in her backyard, and sometimes at night I'd see her in her dressing gown, bounding up and down the back stairs like an 18-year-old flapper. What was she doing running up and down the stairs? Lord knows what Mrs. Millerstead did with herself day or night. She was a queer old duck in some ways, if you'll excuse me saying so. She had money, but that was obvious. Mrs. Roberts paused, remembering. Sonia told me not long after she moved in that all the windows were nailed shut. I suppose we'll have to take precautions these days against thieves, but that was going a bit far. Maybe she kept her money under the bed. If she did, they never found it. Or told anyone they found it, I said, half joking. No, I won't have that, said Mrs. Roberts with a hint of reproach. It was Mr. Dale who used to live opposite who found her, and never a more honest man has ever drawn breath. What happened? Oh, you don't want to hear stories like that about the house you're living in, she said. I only just stopped myself from yelping, yes I do, and instead said, well, 
Now that I know part of the story, I might feel more comfortable living there if you'd tell me the rest. Well, Mr Dale shifted not long after this happened, and this happened almost seven years ago, so my recollection of what he told me might be a little foggy, but it seems that he'd seen her lights on day and night for five days straight, so he went over to see if she was all right. He knocked on the front door, and when there was no answer, he went around to the back. There was washing on the line, and the back door was open, so he started up the stairs and was halfway up when he smelt. Well, I think you know what I mean. I nodded, my imagination supplying more than I wanted. She was sitting at a table in the middle of the main room with her head down in a book. Mrs Roberts continued. And the flies were thick about her face. Ever get something you wish you'd never asked for? And the flies were thick about her face. I carried that image back to Sonia's house, back to the room where it had happened. My eyes kept straying to the table. Did you buy this place furnished? I asked Sonia when she came home around lunchtime. Furnished? Yes, I did. Why? I told her. Did you know that story? Not in such detail. I hope you didn't sound like a ghoul asking questions like that. I've got to live here, you know. Mrs Roberts gave you a funny look when you returned the car? Well, no. There you go, then. I was all discretion intact, and another piece of puzzle slotted in. You mean that now we know Mrs Millstead ran up and down the back stairs at night like a young woman? What does that tell us? That Mrs Millstead was a young woman at night? Ernie! No, seriously! Mrs Next Door said she was always in her dressing gown when she did this. Mrs Millstead was sleepwalking, you see? Sleep running, you mean? A ninety-year-old woman? Not when she was asleep, Sonia. When she was asleep, she was eighteen or however old she was when this thing happened. The sinking ship? Yes. She could have been running up and down companionways in her mind. She may have lost her husband at sea. Make that crying stop. That's what I said in my sleep. Make that wretched crying stop, is what you said, Sonia. Who do you suppose she was talking to? Mr. Millerstead? Whoever he may have been. In all my searching yesterday, I never once came across his name, yet it must be written down somewhere. That's it! What is? A way to get some information. A thread to pull now. Today. I leafed through the phone book, found a number and made a call. When the other end answered, I gave them Mrs Milstead's name and date of death, and eventually received a positive answer. I grabbed the bike helmets down from the top of the bookcase and tossed Sonia hers. Come on, we're going to do some heavy reading. But the library closed at twelve. We're going to a different public amenity, I said. Heavy reading. (laughs) Sonia snorted and made a face as we threaded our way through the acres of marble in the Tuwong Cemetery, Brisbane's largest graveyard. It terraced over hillsides and checkered into thickly wooded areas. Tombstones, mausoleums, obelisks, statues, and somewhere amongst them lay Mrs Emma Milstead. The cemetery's administration office had left Mrs Milstead's burial record at the front desk as I'd requested in my phone call and we were able to find the grave's location on a map of the place immediately we arrived. It had been a bit of luck finding the cemetery where Mrs Milstead was buried straight away. She could have been buried at any of the smaller graveyards, like the one five kilometres south of Castle Hill Road where Sonia's father was interred. But as this was the only one with its offices open on Saturday, it was the obvious starting point. And luckily I hit pay dirt, if you'll excuse the phrase, first off. What exactly do you expect to find, Ernie? Sonia asked as we started off along the trails. More info. Loving wife of. Something about Mr Milstead. I think he's the key to this. Half an hour later, we were on high ground, resting beneath the shadow of the Blackhall Monument, a tall Victorian spire which dominates the central hill. The cemetery spread out below us like a miniature city of streets and towers. The hike up the hill had taken a lot out of me and more than once I'd had to sit on a tombstone to wait for a dizzy spell to pass while Sonia made anxious noises about returning. No, 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 I grouched each time, and eventually we pressed onto the top. Once there, however, Sonia put a foot down. This is not doing your health any good, Ernie. The way you're pushing yourself, you'll have a relapse. Give me five minutes. Anyway, it's all downhill from here. Yes, but from the grave back again, it's all uphill. Your pneumonia has left you in a bad way, and if you push yourself too much, you could give yourself a stroke or something. Bullshit, I said, unable to think of a more reasoned argument. Give me the grave location card. I'll go and see what it says on the stone. Okay, 
OK, but take the map too, or you'll wander the cemetery for the rest of your life. Like the Flying Dutchman? I'll be back before you can say, Waar is die zeven in Wintingsten handgeun en afdeling als du lief? In other words, you'll be gone all day. Your laughter trailed eerily among the graves and was gone. Time went by, and while I waited, my mind turned to the sort of fancies best not thought of in graveyards. What if night came and Sonia hadn't come back? What if she never came back? What if Mrs Milstead resented our prying into what she may have done, may have been sad over or ashamed of in her past, and came stalking me through the graves and I couldn't run? What if she was even now watching me from behind the black Blackall Monument with a face thick with flies? I spun about. There was nothing there. I started a circuit of the monument to prove there was nothing there, and halfway round I almost collided with Sonia coming the other way. I have just returned from the grave, <laughs> she said, grinning. Strictly not funny, I gasped. So, what did it say on the stone? She handed me the grave location card with some penciled notes on the back. You were right about there being a mention of loving wife of. There was also a Mr. Milstead's date of death, the 15th of the 4th, 1912, but that's about all, apart from his Christian name. Which was? I looked at the card and read. Ernest? Why did I feel someone had just then walked over my grave? Coincidence, I said. Maybe. We made our way down to the cemetery entrance by easy stages. While biking back to Castle Hill Road, a memory dropped into place so hard it jolted me on the pillion seat, causing the bike to swerve about for several seconds. When she had it under control again, Sonia slid it to a stop in the gravel, lifted her visor and got ready to abuse me in English, Dutch and any other language to hand. Instead, she stared at me in surprise, and I can only suppose I must have looked as shocked as I felt at that moment. Fifteen, four, twelve, I said numbly. What? The 15th of April, 1912. That's when the Titanic went down. Neither Sonia nor myself had more than a layman's knowledge of the event. I only knew the date because it had been a history question I failed at school. To find out more, we did the rounds of the retail and second-hand bookshops of Brisbane but none were able to help us. So we went to a video library, found a night to remember, took it home, and ran it through that evening. I don't believe it, said Sonia, as the end came up over a scene of floating wreckage. They put 2,200 people on a ship that had lifeboats for only a 1,000? The past's a foreign country. They speak a different language there. OK, if we take the film as reasonably close to real events, what have we learnt from it? That the poorer you are, the more chance you have of being left to drown. Tut, tut. Cynicism in one so young. I'm older than you by a year, so I'm allowed to be cynical. Anyway, didn't you hear that crewman say? If they're going to lower them, why don't they put some people in them? Some of those boats were going away half full. And after the ship had gone down, what about what was said in one of those boats about going back for the people in the water? And the man at the tiller said, wait till things settle down. And someone else said, wait till they're all dead of cold, you mean? Bet that was indicative of what happened in most of the half-empty boats. Would you have gone back? Of course. Would you? Why had I said that? I was vaguely aware of the sea and of the fact I was not quite in control of what I was saying. Would you have risked being swamped in that freezing water? If all the boats had gone back, there would have still been a thousand people left floundering. Better than fifteen hundred left floundering. Yes, but would you have risked it? Mr Lowe picked up people from the water, said Sonia in that voice from the previous night. Mr. Lowe was a hero, Emma, my dear, I said, my voice also changing, the sea returning the cold to the room. And with the sea came strands of music, but vague, as if only half remembered. You and I were not heroes, old girl. We were just ordinary frightened people, and you did what ordinary frightened people do at times like that. Ernie, I didn't want to leave you, but no one in my boat wanted to go back, and I never even had the courage to protest. Well, you couldn't very well be expected to stand out against massed opinion, could you? There may have been space in the boat, but you could hardly have picked up all of us. You would all have died had you come back. We would have pulled you all down with us in a panic. I did die. I died in life. I crept as far away as I could go, yet I never really left the ship, Ernie. And I never really left you. And I never really left you, Emma. To see the way your dreams and memories tortured you, tortured me fourfold. 
Many's the time I tried to speak with you, but you had built a wall around your mind and it kept me out. The music and the sea altered, merged, became a prolonged rumble, grown louder and louder. I saw the great ship in my mind, standing vertical in the water, her innards ripping loose, crashing to the bow, submerged deep. Her lights blinked and went out forever. She held for a moment, rearing blackly upright in the ocean, then began her plunge, going, going, sliding faster and faster, engulfed at the end in froth and steam, surging bubbles, away and gone. Sonia slapped her hands to her ears as Emma said, Oh, make that wretched crying stop! The chaos subsided and the sea returned, combined with another, more horrible sound of moaning and wailing, the cries of the drowning and the freezing close by. Emma, dear, only you can make the crying stop when you stop doing this to yourself. If there's any guilt, it belongs to the men who sent so many people onto the ocean, knowing there were lifeboats for less than half. Don't take their punishment, dear. They're not worth it. Come with me now. Come out of your darkness. Come towards the light. All this time. Towards the light. Something seemed to fall out of me. I blinked as if awakening, just in time to see Sonya doing the same thing. The room was warm, and outside the night was still and quiet. <laughs> On the day before I was to return to Melbourne, Sonia and I went on a bit of a book crawl in nearby Ipswich. In a little second-hand shop, we finally found a book on the Titanic, Geoffrey Marcus's Maiden Voyage. The Titanic's a fascinating subject, and I found this particular book particularly so in an unexpected way, because it made me wonder if it might have been the one Mrs Milstead had been reading when she suffered her heart failure. It's all speculation, of course. But Mrs Milstead had spent most of her life hiding as far from the disaster as she could get. And I can't help wondering what might have happened had she opened the book at the photos and read, not the caption, the Titanic of Queenstown, the ship's last port of call in Ireland, but the printing error, the Titanic of Queensland. <laughs> Author's Note the Seas of Castle Hill Road is just about the only story I've ever begun without having the vaguest idea of how it was going to end. Normally I have to know how a story will finish before I can start it. Unusual for me, The Seas of Castle Hill Road was started blind, running solely at first on the ambience of a large wooden house on stilts I was visiting at the time in the northern tropical state of Queensland. It was, I remember thinking, the very setting for a haunted house story. That it was well inland... What better hook than to hear the sea at night? But what did it mean? That had me puzzled until about a third of the way through. Then the rationale behind all these irrational happenings came clear to me. I pride myself in being something of an intense Titanic buff. My ghost hunter, Ernie Pine, is a very unwilling sort of hero. And this was neither the first nor the last time he was thrown protesting into a ghost story. His first instinct is to run away screaming. A very sensible fellow in some respects. The house as described, sans ghosts, is real with its high stilts and once upon a time nailed down windows. So is the Tu Wong Cemetery with its hills and terraces of graves and Black All Monument dominating the highest ground. Sonia is a real person, very much as I've written her. A child immigrant from Holland, much bemused to see herself in print in a supernatural drama. Axel, the dog, also existed. All right, welcome back. Thanks for listening to the uh, story, the beautiful wunderbar story by Mr. Rick Kennett, The Seas of Castle Hill Road. Hope you enjoyed that. And I also hope you enjoyed our uh, quite embarrassing attempts at an Australian accent. <laughs> I, I doubt that that's possible. Not to be confused with our Cambodian accents, which are coming next week. Oh, yeah. 
neither of us actually uh, narrated that last story. You want to tell me how that came about, babe? Oh, that's right. I figured that uh, our Australian accents were so terrible that all people would be much better off if they were to hear a true, actual Australian to read that story. So I went on to the Escape Artists Forum and just posted that I needed some Australians. And we were able to get genuine, bona fide Australians to read that story. So I, I'd like to say big thanks to our readers. And here's a Vegemite sandwich for you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bryce. <laughs> yeah. oh, Amen. So you know something else interesting about this story? I don't. Am I supposed to? No, I was going to tell you about it. So anyways, it's an Australian story with the Dutch parts thrown in there turns out that cameron uh the narrator he had a dutch mother-in-law that uh helped him to work his way through the dutch parts that were in there well that's lucky man yeah that's what i thought which was i thought was really strange it's funny uh, there's this little clip that uh oh wait ot can you play that outtake for me what is the eminent of big tension and duffling else to belief now, note to the editor, I have a Dutch mother-in-law, and even she can't help me get through this, but I'm going to give it another go. But is the seven and twigs tan shen and a fling galstublief? Goodness gracious me, this will go in the bloopers reel, I tell you. So even his Dutch mother-in-law couldn't help him get through those words. Uh, luckily for him, though, the character of Ernie didn't really have to say very much Dutch. But Sonia, she actually had some serious Dutch lines to say. Well, it turns out that Jacinta, who read the lines of Sonia, also knew somebody who spoke Dutch that helped her through the Dutch lines. Oh, do you know anybody who speaks Dutch? I don't. I, I don't have... either. That's amazing. Okay, well, hey, thank them for me next time you talk to them. I will. So, again, this is the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. We present fiction stories submitted by you, the listener. Has John Smith written all these stories under no. different pseudonyms? <laughs> wow. If you have a story you'd like to submit for our consideration, how do they get those stories to us? They uh, drop that story into the body of an email and send it off to submissions at doonsteve.com. That's cool. Also, if you have any comments or suggestions about the stories, you're welcome to just put a comment there on the blog on doonsteve.com, which is our website. And a big... I got a question for you. I, I hope it's okay. We, we normally kind of have a schedule of things, and, and, uh -huh. and I, I would hate to interrupt the begging oh, for donations. Throwing us but um, dunesteef.com, uh, D U N E S T E E F, uh, and then dot com. I'm uh -huh. really sure. Is right, that K O M? Right, right. uh, <laughs> what the word dunesteef? That seems like an unusual word. Is that is that some? Is it another language? What is dunesteef? You know, it's a funny story, kind of a long story, but uh, shoot, it's our podcast. We can take as long as we want, right? Well, I, I'm curious. I, I would think that whatever listeners would be curious, too. All right. Well, I, I'll tell you the story. It, uh, it's a little creepy. It's a little uh, on the south side of normal, but... Uh, it was on a night just like this one. That's right. Wait. Our, our, oh, wait, O.T., play the thunderclap. Perfect. So anyways, my father was a yuppie, right? He was one of those guys who all he did was work all the time, every minute of every day. And, uh, so we never saw the guy. And uh, so one day after my brother got high, stole a car, and burned his school down, uh, my mom browbeat my father into taking us out on a camping trip, you know, so that it, we can bond and maybe my dad could establish himself as a father figure and... Uh, Maybe my brother would then stop pulling these kind of stunts or something. I mean, it's this a, is this is your older brother. It's my younger brother. Younger, yeah. okay. So, anyways, we all went camping uh, together, and these two tents weren't big enough to hold all three of us. So, um, I got stuck sleeping in one tent by myself, and my dad and my brother were in the, uh, the other tent. And uh, my dad wanted to, you know, make sure my brother didn't sneak out. And oh, that was smart. In the middle of the night. So, so there I am trying to sleep in my tent. And uh, suddenly, the entire campground is lit up. It was like broad daylight. It was so brilliant. It was like they'd set up like a stadium, a sports stadium, right outside the door of my tent. And they were playing a night game or something. And the lights started swirling around. And they started casting all sorts of 
crazy shadows um, from the trees onto the walls of my tent and the light turned from white to red and then from red to yellow and then there's this like this weird song that just goes dum 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 and then the lights went out it was pitch black and you know, I was freaking out. So I hopped out of my tent to see if my dad and my brother were okay. And when I went in and unzipped the tent, I saw that my dad was in there snoring. Uh, but my brother was completely gone. I woke my dad up and he didn't know anything. He didn't hear the sounds. He didn't see the lights or anything. He thinks my brother snuck out and I'm like covering for him or something. Anyways, we looked for my brother for the entire night. And we finally found him in a nearby field. And the field had been done up in one of those crop circles. You know, the ones that you see on the news and, like, it was on that M. Night Shyamalan movie. It was a village. Yeah, that was it. He was laying there, and he's just staring up at the sky without blinking. And he was, like, catatonic, except for one thing. He was murmuring one word over and over again. He was going, Dune Steve. Dune Steve. Dune Steve. And laughing, this really creepy laugh, like, <laughs> Dune Steve. Wow, really? I, I, you know, I, I'd never heard this story before. How, what, what ended up happening with your brother? How, how is he now? Uh, he's fine. He's a kindergarten teacher in California now. It turns out it was just a bad trip. Wait, a bad trip? What about the lights and, and the sound, the stuff that you saw? Oh, uh, yeah forgot about that hmm anyway um we do pay our authors here at the dune steve audio fiction magazine so we have a button on our website a little paypal button that uh, will connect you right up with the folks at paypal where you can donate some money to the cause of fantastic audio fiction that's right and i'd like to add that we are still holding our microphones <laughs> and uh, any donation great or small would be greatly appreciated plus Beyond the good feeling that they will have for at least, I don't know, three minutes, anybody who donates gets to say what? I pressed the button. That's right. I, I don't think you can put a dollar sign on that. All right. So here we are. It's November now. October is over. And the therefore the October Scary Story event is also over. That's um, right. It's closed its doors. Uh, for now. Ryan. Those doors are... Constantly swinging open again because... Those gates never stay closed for long. That's, is that a song? No. That should be a song. Okay. There's our, oh. uh, our November scary song <laughs> event idea right there. But uh, so, yeah, I noticed that we had some submissions. Yeah. And it wasn't just like the day before Halloween, but they were coming in all through the month. That was really cool, yes. And uh, how, did, how did yours go? Um, I, I, I did finish oh, yeah? the story. Weeks and... earlier? No, I, I mean, to be honest, I finished to, today. But, I, you know, I think it turned out pretty good. It's, it's not written. What what's going on? Uh, he says, what's the deal? How, how come you're late? Oh, well, I'm just a couple of days late. I, I was just right up there to the dead. <laughs> what? <laughs> he says it was your contest and you didn't finish. No, 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 I, I, I did finish. It's just, I, I just, I was really busy. So I, what? It's November. You finished in November. So? <laughs> so the contest date was the 31st. You had to be done by. What this says who? He, he says he's got a, an audio clip he's going to play for us. All right. I hope it's Die Hard. But you couldn't start writing it till October came on the calendar. And then it had to be done by Halloween. So you have until October 31st at midnight to finish the story. Well, all right. Uh, well, I, I don't remember making that statement. <laughs> all right. That's cool. <laughs> uh, how about you? How did you do? Well, I'm about halfway through with my story. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Now, where, where is ROA.OT on this? Uh, don't, don't you have something you want to say to Big Anklevich? Okay, what did he say? He says, you suck. That's, that's <laughs> you all he says. Yeah, you... Wait, who, who sucks? You. Wait, why, why me? I, look, he, didn't, he only got halfway. <laughs> I will finish it, though. 
He says all that matters is that you blew it. I don't know, man. I'm not a real big fan of R.I.O.T. <laughs> His story was good, though. He finished it on time, unlike the rest of the hosts. I pity the fool that has to read those stories. Wait, who, who has to read these stories? Oh, that would be us. That's right. Oh. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll read through the stories, and in our next podcast, we'll talk about what we thought, and, uh, we'll, we'll, and we'll just tell people how it went. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll be able to uh, say what we thought of the stories, and maybe we can even announce a few of the uh, stories that will be coming up in some upcoming weeks. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Uh, oh, an interesting thing. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we did uh, uh, our first story in October by uh, that author named Jonathan Schlosser. Yes, uh, Jonathan J. Schlosser. It was right, Schlosser. And you had a <laughs> I can't yeah. Say it even now. You had a really hard time not calling him Jonathan Slosher. Uh, yeah, I don't know what what is up with that weird name. No. You know what's really funny is he sent us an email the next day and he said, "Yeah, that was humorous, but." Uh, uh, the interesting thing is, my name is pronounced Jonathan Slosher. No. Yeah. <laughs> Son of a b- with a b- sticking on it b- to the dog's b- when he was licking the b- can't believe the b- monkey b- dinosaur. Luckily, he didn't send us a hate letter about how we butchered his name. No, um, let's, I'll tell you what. I'll take one for the team, and we won't read a hate letter this week. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Oh. Oh, wow. This one's kind of weird. How so? Uh, They actually like the show? No. No, definitely not that. But it looks like a poem or something. Let me see. Um, Dear Dune Steve, I think that I shall never find a podcast as unsuccessful as thine. The Dune Steve sucks, it couldn't be plainer, and you two freaks could not be lamer. Jeez. It's much more pleasant to choke on a fish than listen to the rantings of Outfield Rish. And, oh, what a moron is Big Anklevich. I can't tell you how I hate that son of a bitch. Jeez. And a wait OT really sucks, too. You know it's true. Nice try, man. Your readings are weak, your voices are grating, your jokes are oral defecating. Oh. I take no pleasure in all I've said. I'll only be happy when you two are dead. But thank you for giving me time to beef. Good night, and up yours, Dune Steve. Signed, William Wordsworth Longfellow, Jr. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Yeah. Okay, it looks like our show's wound down. Uh, we're going to go ahead and head out. And I'm Big Anglovich. And I'm Rish Outfield, advising you, don't try to be a great man. Just be a man and let history decide for itself. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. <laughs>